Hello and welcome to the program. My name is Michael Finney. Today I am joined by Spencer Cavanaugh. Would you like to say hello, sir? Hi, yeah. Thank you for having me on the show. Looking forward to talking about this. Great. So let's hear a little bit about your background, who you are, what you do, and uh, you know anything you feel is important that people should know. Sure, yeah. Uh, my background is formally in uh, filmmaking and, and screenwriting, but gradually I got more and more into not quite programming, but using certain technologies to help organizations set themselves up and go about kind of democratic governance uh, using open source software and and, uh, and really censorship resistant technology. And that's what I've gradually built up a consulting practice around um, in this really fascinating frontier world of, of Web3. Uh, so excited to talk about that a bit. Yeah. Uh, have you worked on anything in film and screenwriting that we might know about? Uh, no, not not really. I mean, the only screenplay that I wrote that was made into a film was a short film in, in college. Um, and then aside from that, I did some screenplay evaluations, but nothing that got any major release. Yeah, that's still awesome. I'm working on a couple of short films myself. Oh, really? Huh? Yeah. Not that. Uh, AI stuff. <laughs> Uh, have, there, have you written anything that was made into a, a short or, or these feature length or anything like that? No, no. Uh, I, you know, this is, this is just a, a side passion project of mine. You know, basically I had written a short story like a year and a half ago, and then there was a competition that came up for AI short film. And I was like, Oh, you know, what am I looking for something to turn into something visible and kind of went and dug through all the old records and found something that I thought would convert visually and narratively and even even if it doesn't if it doesn't end up as a film i think it's an interesting kind of medium storytelling medium very visual and bare bones absolutely so inside of the work that you're doing in terms of consultation kleinomenic right is your company that's where you are offering services yeah, yeah. Clinomenic has started out just as a, a moniker, you know, something that a, like a Discord handle or a message board handle. And then I started engaging with people in the Web3 world and the whole industry of DAOs started operating under this moniker. And then gradually, as things became a bit more professional, I, I doxed myself, started doing business under my name, but using the term Clinomenic as my business entity, which I set up. So now it's sort of morphed from a, a moniker to a, a business vehicle. Uh, to limit personal liability and to do business through. So I now do business through uh, Clinomenic LLC as a, as a consultant. Very cool. What does that look like typically when you are working with an organization? So I'm, I've only had a couple clients so far and what it looks like is like early stage startups or DAOs. If, if you think it's important, I can get into what DAOs are, but uh, also mostly in the kind of nonprofit or public goods realm very early stage helping the founding group of people set up their kind of organizational architecture like how they go about making decisions are they going to be voting on proposals what does that voting process look like uh, kind of s establishing all of that so that they have a legitimate shared reference frame for how to operate as a as a group of people productively and so a lot of it also uses certain cutting edge technology like smart contracts and other open source uh, bits of software to help like, build this kind of virtual organization architecture for them to operate with. Can you delineate what is a, you know, maybe a traditional organization and a virtual organization? Uh, how do they differ and where are they the same? Sure. Yeah. So a lot of the time there's you know, a group of people that start about some business enterprise and then if they want to limit personal liability for the business that they do, they would start, they would, you know, form a legal entity and there's various options there, but it's something that would exist for tax purposes, like a separate entity. And that that business entity would assume the liability of the business that they're doing. And in the traditional world, I'm not a lawyer, but I've had a little bit of experience setting up these entities. There is a, like you need a responsible party to deal with, to communicate with the IRS. A lot of time you need a physical presence in the jurisdiction that you have the entity formed in. Um, and maybe that's, uh, you actually have a storefront there, or maybe it's just a, a registered agent. Um, but in the traditional world, a lot of it looks like this. People are doxxed. Everyone, everyone's name needs to be known. 
And in this more uh, esoteric kind of nascent world of DAOs, um, the term I'm using virtual organization kind of has some meaning in the traditional world. It kind of just means this um, horizontal organizational framework where departments are kind of siloed and kind of have some degree of autonomy and just kind of coordinate as units in a less hierarchical structure. But in, in the broader sense, it's just any kind of organization that exists in more of an internet native uh, fashion. So like these are with a lot of DAOs um, today or in, in virtual organizations, uh, people are working remotely from across the world in different time zones without showing up to some shared physical place or office together. And at least the way I'm using virtual organization is in that broader sense. So what benefits do they get access to when working like this? How, how have you seen it play out? I think it's similar to the effect the internet had in a kind of cultural sense that you're able to find more specific niche like communities of people with similar interests or temperaments. And it's sort of like you get a, you could, you get to cast a wider net in terms of the people you meet and attract and get to work with and associate with. And I think with DAOs, a lot of people converge in this space because they are passionate about how this technology can change democratic decision-making or they believe in certain values of transparency because it's all happening on open source technology. And I think that kind of common ethos spread out across the whole world attracts like a much bigger kind of talent pool than if someone had these beliefs and was just limited to who they could work with within like commuting distance, I suppose. If that makes any sense. I'm not sure if that gets at your, your question. Well, you know, uh, the questions are really just a platform for picking your brain. Yeah. Okay. You know, wherever you end up going with it, that answer is probably the right one. Maybe my question's wrong. Let's drill down a little bit into what you're talking about in regards to DAOs, right? A, de a decentralized autonomous organization and its relationship to Web3. How do you see those things fitting together? Sure. Yeah, so the, the term DAO has been used to describe a lot of online communities and internet native businesses that use pretty radically decentralized um, authority structures and decision-making processes. A lot of them hold funds in the form of crypto assets on shared accounts, sometimes massively shared accounts that hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of people have a vote on how to disperse funds from these shared accounts. And all of this voting, whether it's for making some purchase or some disbursement, or just ratifying some constitution that this group of people is to abide by. All of this voting unfolds on a public, transparent database. In this case, mostly blockchains, but there are other solutions as well. And so DAOs in, in general are communities of people that use this open public, open public uh, infrastructure. You can think of it as like uh, civic infrastructure or decision-making infrastructure that's public and very difficult to corrupt or, or censor. Uh, use this public framework for coming to decisions, whether those decisions are financial, financial or not. And it kind of opens up this whole new field of uh, enterprise and businesses or, or nonprofit enterprises as well, which is where I'm, I'm a bit more interested. But DAOs generally refer to organizations that are built like this using Web3 technology, which is like blockchain and similar technologies. There seems to be a lot of relationship with governance and decision making inside of that. How does it typically function or if not typically, what sort of ways have you seen it um, develop or take shape in terms of those relationships for decision making? Uh, you're totally right. I mean, to me, the big, the most interesting part of all this is the implications it has for governance and collective decision making. And across all the various examples of DAOs over the last five, six years or so, uh, you've seen, you know, you can see the whole spectrum from pretty centralized ones to pretty radically decentralized ones that no one really has admin control over. 
And on the more centralized end, they kind of look like traditional organizations where there's some kind of executive or board-like account. Uh, in this case, it's usually multi-signature wallets. So for anyone who isn't familiar, that's it's sort of like a shared bank account, but it's uh, permissionless to use. You don't have to get anyone's permission or in any institution's permission to start one of these. Uh, it's very inexpensive. It's instant. You can have one of these shared accounts with anyone on the planet who has a Web3 wallet address, which is also free to make. And so what on the more centralized end of DAOs, it's usually a multi-signature wallet, you know, five to nine people on a shared account. Uh, and it would just take some majority of those signers to agree to send some money out of that shared account, that treasury. And usually on the more centralized end of DAOs, there's that kind of shared account and then there's the whole body of, of voting members in that community or in that organization. And a lot of the time, on the more centralized end again, the members are just voting to signal their preferences or to like ratify certain decisions, but it ultimately still requires the approval of that, uh, that shared account on top to actually send the funds or make the decision. So in that sense, the more centralized end of the spectrum does kind of look like traditional organizations just operating on more transparent uh, infrastructure, you know, th these open source databases like blockchains. And on the more radically decentralized end, you can actually have an algorithm uh, called a smart contract that runs on these public databases, facilitate, not only facilitate the voting of an arbitrary number of people, it could be tens of thousands of members in a DAO, but it can, it can also hold funds inside of it. So instead of the treasury being in a shared account of seven people, it can be in a shared account of 10,000 people. And in order for any funds to be moved, at least 50% of those 10,000 people would need to agree or based on whatever quorum they set, maybe they set a smaller quorum so that someone of that 10,000 makes a proposal to send $5,000 to some counterparty and the majority of people who vote on that proposal need to be in favor for the proposal to be made. And it doesn't require any kind of uh, intermediary or, or uh, executive figure to actually approve that transaction. And in this sense, this is still, still pretty experimental in a lot of cases. Uh, there's a lot of legal entity innovation going on to try to accommodate this, but it is still a frontier, a, a bit of a wild west. Uh, but the implications, I think, are, are pretty profound that you can do essentially direct democracy at arbitrary scale now. Yeah, there seems to be a recreation of traditional hierarchy inside of what you're describing. And, you know, I'm not super familiar with the operational level of DAOs. I obviously am familiar with them philosophically, and I think that there's some good applications for that. I wonder at times because they are so distributed how that interfaces with any one jurisdiction or if there's maybe uh, multiple jurisdiction interactions can you tell us how some of that works sure yeah so in in my case i'm based in, in the u.s for anyone listening and so my my experience with setting up entities for four DAOs now. They've all been US-based with a variety of options. There's um, like the more traditional one is just to have some kind of associated corporation or LLC that the kind of the board members, the signers on that top multi-sig would be on. And then there can be a larger stakeholder body of, of members, uh, whether they're token holders or represented some other way. And so in that sense, it can look pretty much like a, uh, like a traditional organization, but just with new technology to kind of expedite things in certain respects. Um, but as far as the more diffuse and international DAOs that can have hundreds of thousands of members spread across the world um, and how authority is delegated there and how entities are set up, I think in those cases, I haven't had any clients that big, but in those cases, I would imagine that there would kind of be these like satellite entities uh, sometimes in like Cayman Islands or Marshall Islands or a lot of the more, um, you know, areas that you would kind of think of as being more accommodating for tax purposes. Um, or I think there's also some options in, in Switzerland. 
And so in the larger cases like that, I would imagine it would involve someone in some member of that large DAO who has, who is either themselves a legal expert or is working with legal experts and they make a proposal to say, uh, start uh, an entity. So like one example right now is uh, Purple DAO. And that's, uh, I'm not involved in it, but I'm, I'm watching it from the sidelines. It's this kind of social media DAO. There's this really interesting social media protocol called a uh, Farcaster. Yeah. Uh, and it's, yeah, okay, so, so you know of that. And then there's essentially a lot of people in the Farcaster uh, community that are trying to start this DAO to kind of not quite govern it, but to kind of steward the development of it and, and steward its ecosystem and everything. And there's an active proposal now to to start an entity for it, for Purple DAO in the Marshall Islands. And then the proposal itself, if it passes, it would probably, like in ratifying certain decisions, it would probably endow that entity once it's made with certain authorities. And then that proposal, because it's public, will kind of be seen as some kind of testament to this group of people, this group of stakeholders recognizing some kind of legitimacy in whatever entity is made there. Um, but it's also still not quite clear how, like, what that means for members of different national jurisdictions. I think a lot of the, the answers and, and best practices haven't really uh, arisen yet. And, and in that, like, that sense, like, on a legal sense, it is still very much a frontier. I was not aware that I was not aware of the existence of Purple Dow in relationship to the Farcaster protocol, but I do use Warpcast at least once a week. Um, in terms of social media platforms, I think what they're doing is very interesting in the way that it allows for the content or the media to be distributed across different interfaces. Obviously, uh, you know, Warpcast kind of split off from Farcaster and rebranded because the protocol was going to be one thing. And it sounds like they needed that to happen because of the governance aspects um, as it relates to some of the other developers creating functionality or interfaces for the, the protocol. And now, in addition to that, the DAO that you're talking about. Is Purple DAO the most successful instance of one of these organizations that you've seen, or is there another example that has gone further and hit a, a higher level of success with things? Uh, yeah, there are a few examples that come to mind there, um, and also your points about Farcaster and, and distributed social media, I think are really, really interesting. I'm happy to get into that later if there's, if there's time or if you're interested. Um, but to answer your question, the big, the big DAOs are mostly all the DeFi DAOs. And, and if any, for anyone who isn't uh, familiar with that, it's, it stands for decentralized finance. It's probably the, the most um, prominent industry that uses Web3 technology right now. Uh, it's just a lot of uh, fancy open source technology to facilitate uh, like financial instruments and lending uh, and and issuance of synthetic assets and all and a bunch of fancy financial uh, processes and so the big DAOs so far are probably all the big um, DeFi DAOs like Uniswap or or Maker or Ave that have some kind of to tokenized governance and have probably a, an incredibly diffuse membership body across the world. And they all, I, I'm not familiar with which legal entities they have. I, I'd imagine they each have at, at least a couple, uh, probably these kind of satellite stewardship entities or these foundations, like how, you know, Ethereum Foundation exists or there's like a Solana Foundation, um, but they don't, at least to, to my understanding, don't necessarily control these larger protocols or ecosystems, but they kind of steward it and they kind of um, interface with the existing legal system in ways that, uh, an informal entityless DAO wouldn't be able to do, um, but I, I would say the bigger ones are probably all the the DeFi DAOs. Interesting. Yeah, I'm you know loosely familiar, not a heavy subscriber to the DeFi community, but definitely like to watch it develop, and I think that they're going to get somewhere with it. Um, obviously, 
you know, it, it, they've had great traction. I think that in the face of traditional finance, there's, there's, there's a lot further distance to go in regards to solidifying that community or that space, that side of the industry against how people typically do banking um, or finance in, in, a, in a broader sense. Yeah, you're you're definitely right in terms of earning people's trust, and especially the trust of uh, of essentially non technical kind of nerds that are already at this frontier and, and using all this stuff and are able to jump through all these technical hoops and read all these technical documentations. It, it's still at a point where a lot of it isn't quite accessible to people, and and the platforms that are really accessible are really just normal financial institutions dressed up in a, in a bunch of new. A terminology um and, and i think that's like there's a very uh, I, I don't know if i want to say like libertarian or, or anarcho-capitalist kind of strain to defy right now and that it's resisting being captured by institutions and, and regulatory frameworks but on you know the other side of that coin is that if you lose money through one of these things or if one of these institutions just runs away with a bunch of depositor funds there isn't always a clear uh, you know, uh, recourse that that you as a victim, as a financial victim, can take there because a lot of these protocols aren't like aren't aren't necessarily um, accounted for or enshrined in the legal framework right now. N- not necessarily because they're trying to avoid it, but also because the legal framework doesn't quite know how to how to like deal with them or approach them. Uh, so, like in that sense, it that's again just the kind of frontier, wild west uh, status of these things. So let me ask you this. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you feel is important to address? Uh, I mean, we we touched on some of the the governance stuff, and I think one thing that's important for me to convey is that all this all this technology, like if you want to create a DAO, if you want to create a shared account and start using these and various other smart contracts and open source algorithms to facilitate business processes or business structures. It's all, it's all um, permissionless. Like you don't need anyone's permission to to do all this stuff, uh, and it's mostly it's pretty inexpensive too. Like you can deploy all this stuff for a maximum of like fifteen twenty dollars, uh, depending on what the transaction fees are like for that day. Um, but the difficulty is just how inaccessible a lot of it is, and how and how dense a lot of these um, uh, apps are to use in terms of user interface. Um, but I like one thing that that I do find very inspiring is that if you wanted to create an organization with your peers for some for some uh, purpose, whether it's nonprofit or for profit, it's very easy to set up these tools once you know how to use them, and you don't need to go through an application process to open up a multi signature account or to start a DAO. Um, and then once you have deployed these things, they're all very publicly verifiable and auditable. It's difficult to hide stuff and, and to be, um, you know, to, uh, to like to get away with funneling money out of these things. Like you can kind of see all the maneuvers. So I think that's that's why I believe in it is in the, the transparency and the resistance to censorship and how it can let people work together across the world uh, and send money instantly, pretty much. Um, but I think the the barrier to entry is still pretty high in terms of how complicated it all is to use. Yeah, I do. I do think that the transparency aspect is highly valuable. And it sounds like there are good applications for the technology, for the governance methodologies and the organizations in general. But hey, Spencer, thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you for having me. I love talking about this stuff and, and did very good guiding, guiding this conversation across a variety of really complicated topics. So thank you.